everyone uh, to policy session number two. Uh, this is where we will discuss how central banks uh, can uh, incorporate environment-related risks into their analysis as well as their policy operations. Uh, my name is Emanuele Campiglio. I'm an associate professor at the University of Bologna. I'm also involved with the RFF CMCC European Institute on Economics and the Environment. And it is my great pleasure to be the chair. Um, so the, the, the policy session is supported by the uh, network uh, of central banks and, and supervisors for greening the financial system, the NGFS. So Roman Schwarzman was the prime mover uh, behind this session, but unfortunately couldn't be with us. He couldn't be with us today, so he asked me to uh, replace him. Uh, which, again, I'm doing very, very happily, uh, considering the, the, the panel that we have. So let me introduce them to you briefly. Uh, so first, we will uh, hear from uh, Laura Parisi. So Laura is the team lead of a newly created uh, climate change center at the European Central Bank. And Laura will present the uh, work that the ECB is doing on climate stress testing. Uh, second, we have uh, Ivan Faiella of Banca d'Italia. Banca d'Italia is also one of our generous uh, contributors and partners for the whole conference. And he is the coordinator of another newly created uh, uh, hub uh, for of climate change, on climate change and sustainability. And he will be presenting the results of a climate stress test for Italy. Uh, then we will hear from Mathilde, Mathilde Salim, who is based at the Banque de France, and uh, CIRED as well, where she works on the link between biodiversity and financial risks, and that's what we will uh, hear uh, from, from her. Um, and finally, we have uh, Professor Lars Peter Hansen, who was also our keynote speaker uh, today, so thanks again, Lars, for uh, accepting this double bill. Um, Lars is uh, uh, a professor at the University of Chicago, and among his many achievements, he is also the recipient of the 2013 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science. So, the rules of the game are the following. So, we will hear from our three central bank representatives first. Uh, they will give us more technical contributions of around 10 minutes, where they will present some, some of the uh, work they uh, are doing. And then uh, we will hear from uh, Professor Lance um, Hansen, um, who will transition us into the second round of interventions, which will be more policy oriented. So in the second round, round we will try to understand what central banks can or want uh, to do uh, when it comes to policy and, and the connection to, to climate change. And this should leave us around 30 minutes from uh, of, of questions and, and comments from the audience. So we should have enough time to have a good discussion. So let me stop here. And uh, Laura, I'll just give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind invite and the opportunity of being here in this tremendous panel. Uh, to present a little bit what we are doing as European Central Bank on climate stress testing. Um, I'll try to be quite brief, although I would say it's going to be quite challenging uh, to, to summarize and condense in just 10 minutes uh, this, this exercise. Um, so I, yeah, first of all, sorry, the usual disclaimer applies, so I'm here in my personal capacity, so what I'm going to tell you is not uh, necessarily representing the views of my institution, and uh, I would also like to uh, point you towards uh, the paper that uh, uh, describes in much more details uh, the ECB economy-wide climate stress test that I will briefly describe you right now. So I will try to go uh, through the key messages and, and, the key, uh, and the main results of the exercise just here in this slide. So if you want to basically stop listening to me for the next 10 minutes, you have everything here. Uh, but in the rest of the presentation, I will try to deep dive a little bit into uh, these aspects especially to uh, kind of describe what were the key challenges that we had to face when uh, developing uh, the, the, um, our uh, climate stress test. So the first uh, feature of uh, the exercise is, uh, uh, is about the climate scenarios. So we have used climate scenarios to really account for the interplay between transition and physical risk using a time horizon of 30 years into the future. Uh, 
And to do so, we relied on the work developed by the network within the financial system. The second key feature is about the granularity of the information that we use to uh, really look into the transmission channels of climate risks to the financial sector. So we uh, use a very granular approach on climate and financial information that we collected for millions of corporates to which euro area banks are exposed uh, by a different um, instruments and in particular loans and security holdings. And finally, we also built new models with respect to the traditional ones in order to capture the very specific transmission channels of climate risk uh, into firms' financials uh, using, let's say, two key uh, channels here that are credit and market risk. So going to the results, um, we, uh, we find that the short-term costs of a green transition are always more than compensated by the long-term benefits. So although transitioning towards a greener economy is, of course, not for free, however, in the long run, all these costs are more than offset and actually brings benefits. We also find that in case policies to transition towards a greener economy are not introduced, well, the impact coming from physical risks is becoming increasingly um, higher and uh, non-linearly higher over time. If you combine this non-linearity with the reversible nature of, of climate change, if not, uh, if not mitigated, well, then we'll, this increase will continue over time, uh, even much, much beyond the time horizon that we consider. Uh, third, uh, we find that the impact from climate risks on average increases moderately until 2050. However, the impact of climate change on the financial system is mostly a story of outliers. So we find that this impact is uh, mostly concentrated into some geographical areas and also into some sectors of the economy. And this concentration risk is one of the key features that should be taken into account when uh, having a financial stability perspective. And finally, when looking at tail risks, uh, so focusing on the corporates and banks that are most uh, exposed to climate risk, well, in this case, when, even when talking about magnitude, the impact is potentially very severe and the consequences for financial stability quite material. So when um, developing, when, when we had the idea, let's say, of settling this, uh, this climate stress as exercise, we had to deal with a number of challenges. So we started doing this exercise back in 2019. That's when we had the first idea, and the publication was in 2021. So it took us uh, uh, almost two years, basically, to, to come up with the final numbers and the publication. And especially back in time, there was no much experience about climate stress testing, especially in the central banking community. So a stress test, as it's typically done in a central bank, is an exercise that is testing what is the resilience of targeted institutions, so banks, for example, but also insurance companies or investment funds, to a set of possible scenarios that uh, should be adverse, however realistic. So a typical stress test is conducting, uh, uh, choosing one baseline scenario that is going to represent how basically the macroeconomy will evolve on average over the next three to five years, and an adverse scenario that is instead testing uh, or is instead simulating a very adverse macroeconomic downturn. And according to these two baseline and adverse scenarios, a, a stress test is, is uh, assessing what is the resilience of the financial, of the targeted financial institutions. So there are many different ways you can perform such an exercise, and in particular, these three, so top-down, bottom-up, or constrained bottom-up. So a top-down exercise is, an ex is, a, is a stress test that is performed entirely by the supervisory authority or by the central bank that is in charge, basically, of developing everything from the methodology, from the data collection, the modeling developments, and, and, the, final, um, and the final performance. So the targeted institutions are just subject to this exercise, but they play absolutely no role in there. A completely, let's say, opposite uh, exercise is a bottom-up stress test in which instead the supervisory authority or the central bank only provides some input or parameters, for example, some scenarios or which portfolios uh, to be, uh, to be uh, addressed uh, in order to have sort of common understanding or common calibration of the exercise. However, it's each targeted institution that is responsible for uh, the impact assessment. So, to un so basically self-assess um, the, the, their own portfolios uh, in light of, of some common scenarios. So the targeted institutions are the ones that are in charge of uh, running uh, this entire exercise. In between these two corner solutions, there is a so-called constrained bottom-up stress test in which you have a combination basically of these two. So the supervisory authority of the central bank provides some input and parameters to calibrate the exercise. 
The targeted institution assesses the implications of these parameters on their own portfolios, but then there is a quality check or top-down, let's say, quality assurance that is performed by the supervisory authority again to ensure that the targeted institutions are actually assessing these risks in a, let's say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good manner. And to also ensure a sort of consistency of the results across all of these. So this last exercise is uh, quite uh, um, uh, spread, uh, especially in the European Union. The typical biannual uh, EUI stress test uh, is using such, uh, such approach. And the supervisory, let's say, climate stress, uh, climate stress test that is ongoing right now also uses this. But when we decided to, de to develop our own methodology, we actually opted for a top-down uh, top approach that is exactly the one that I'm gonna, uh, gonna present you right now. So there are always pros and cons about the different approaches that I try to, uh, to just very, very uh, broadly sketch here. So the reason why we chose this kind of approach is because it's less resource intense, we, it can ensure a higher level of granularity because uh, we were responsible basically of collecting all the information it ensures a level playing field and comparability of results because we are applying the same methodology and using the same data for all. So like uh, you have indeed a level playing, playing field and you can target as many institutions as you want and this ensures also uh, a larger, let's say, scope of the exercise. Of course, you have also some cons that is very important to keep in mind. So uh, first of all, we could consider only a limited portion of, of banks' portfolios because our basically knowledge of what banks do have themselves in their balance sheet is deep as a central bank, but limited, uh, especially with respect to what banks know about themselves. And you also have to consider that the one size fit all is a typical criticism that is raised in this, in this regards as you cannot basically incorporate banks' views or assessment of their own uh, bank's management practices. And it's uh, also very limited the way you can um, uh, understand how banks may react to adverse economic conditions into the future. The second challenge that we had to overcome was about the time horizon. So it's very well known that uh, climate change is uh, affecting um, all of us, our economy and also our financial system over a long time horizon. But on the other side, typical stress tests performed in central banks do have a very short time horizon. So our time horizon is typically from three to five years. So a short time horizon would ensure actually a lower level of uncertainty and uh, is, uh, would also be kind of simpler to implement as we could rely on internal uh, already available models or infrastructure or, or approach or know-how and, and expertise. Um, however, mm, the, a short time horizon cannot capture basically the long-term impacts of a changing climate and cannot for sure assess the impact, for example, of chronic physical risk. A long time horizon, so 30 years, for example, uh, is able to assess both transition and physical risk, can assess whether uh, the financial system is, is aligning or what are the implications of an alignment with the Paris targets and can also guide government actions or policy proposals to take strategic decisions to, to really try to drive the financial system towards this Paris alignment. However, on the, on the other side, uh, there is, of course, higher uncertainty that uh, Professor Hansen like, uh, very uh, brilliantly described also earlier this morning. So we opted for a long time horizon in view of these pros and cons, and it's in particular important to keep in mind our perspective that is a policy making perspective. So what we wanted to do, the, the objective here, was to really compare um, what could happen into, into the long term in terms of costs and, and benefits of a green transition versus a no policy action scenario. So what we cared about here is, is really like the trade off between these two. And uh, the, the third, uh, let's say, challenge is really about the lack of uh, uh, available data and uh, the, the lack of uh, granularity, basically, of, of climate data into, uh, into, the, into this field. So in order to overcome this limitation, we identified a firm's exposure to natural hazards. We also uh, geolocated firms in order to assign each of them uh, via their coordinates uh, uh, to a physical risk score that can really measure what is their vulnerability into the long run to different uh, adverse climate scenarios. And uh, we, um, in order to also capture basically the forward-looking perspectives, we, we map the NGFS scenarios into non-financial corporates over the 30 years time horizon. 
So we built this integrated data infrastructure that combines uh, uh, physical transition and financial information for millions of corporates to which euro area banks are exposed via uh, loans and security holdings. And we combined this very granular data set with the proprietary central banking information that tells us what are your area banks' exposures uh, to, these, uh, to these corporates via loans and securities. So the level of granularity that we have in our internal data sets are at the loans and at the security level, so it's extremely granular. So what we ended up here in terms of sample is 2.3 million uh, firms uh, located in, in Europe that account for almost 80% of the entire loans uh, of your area banks. And when, uh, when talking about banks, uh, we have 1,600 consolidated banking groups in the euro area that basically represent the entire, of, uh, the entire monetary financial institutions uh, that we have. So this is really like an extremely large sample that uh, to the best of our knowledge has never been built anywhere else. So I will skip, let's say, some descriptive statistics that you, that you can find uh, uh, in the paper, just to mention that indeed we have a representation of banks' exposures to transition and physical risk at this very high level of granularity. And what we find is that banks' exposures to transition and physical risk are pretty heterogeneous across sectors when it comes uh, to uh, transition risk and across geographies when it comes to um, physical risk, with some banking systems, in, in specifically in South European countries, very much exposed to a change in climate, especially um, climate change is not mitigated. When it comes to the, the models, indeed, once again, I will not go into the details, but happy to take questions about it. So what we, we derived a completely new set of models that can capture transition and physical risk drivers by carbon pricing, technological changes, different in consumer preferences, damages to physical capital uh, coming from physical risk, and also uh, disruption in the production chain to see how all these risk drivers can impact the uh, main balance sheet items of uh, non-financial corporates in Europe, and through these, how these losses can spread to uh, banks' loans and security portfolios. And what we find is that, uh, is shown here in, in these charts, and uh, really like to, to give you some tricky highlights. Uh, the, the charts here is, are, are representing what are the, the differences in the default probabilities of banks' portfolios in an orderly scenario compared to a disorderly transition or a hot house roll scenario. So what we find here is that there are short-term costs of transitioning. However, these short-term costs are, are affecting firms and affecting banks' portfolios up to 2030, after which these short-term costs are absolutely more than compensated by the benefits of, uh, of mitigating climate risk. We also find that physical risks becomes increasingly higher over time, and you can see that when looking at the red line here in the chart on the left-hand side, that is telling you how the default probability compared to an orderly transition scenario may change if climate change is not mitigated. And uh, the charts on the right-hand side are instead showing you what are the distribution of these default probabilities in the different scenarios compared to the baseline across different banking systems. And indeed, it tells you uh, that the, the risks are on average low, but are very much concentrated into some countries. And finally, here you can see that uh, when looking, let's say, when looking at the results in different tails of, of, uh, of our sample, so when looking at the results for banks that are less or more exposed to climate risk, you can see that the results are extremely different. So the, uh, the dash lines here are telling you what are the changes in the default probabilities of banks' portfolios in the three scenarios compared to the current values for, on average, while the, the field lines are telling you the same, but for the banks that are more exposed uh, to, um, to climate risk. And indeed, this is confirming once again that on the one hand, the transition is bringing benefits, even with respect to current values in terms of the fall probabilities in the long run, while if climate change is not mitigated well, then the impact on the most vulnerable financial institutions in our euro system banking system can be very, very adverse, and even five times more, more, more adverse um, in the hot house world scenario than in any other scenario. So I will stop here and happy to take any questions that you may have later on. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, I will just leave the floor to Ivan Faiella, Banca d'Italia. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, uh, that's not my invitation. Uh, I, I start in saying, as Laura, that I'm here on my 
personal capacity, so usually uh, me and the Bank of Italy agree, but in, in case we are not, that's just my fault. Um, here we're, I'm presenting something different, I mean, it's, a, it's more a, a, an, a, an orthodox approach if you want, uh, and actually it's a paper published in Journal of Policy Modeling, and the idea is to model transition risks uh, in, in Italy, uh, looking at the share of uh, financial vulnerable households and firms, I will later explain what are these strange beasts. Um, the, the paper is also uh, available uh, for free on uh, the occasional papers of the Bank of Italy. So what is the idea of the paper? Uh, the idea of the paper is to have good information regarding the channel of transmission of, uh, of uh, transition risk. So use micro data, sample survey, macro data for households and uh, um, uh, um, firm level data for firms and look at what happens when we are imagining a world a kind of counterfactual where uh, there is a carbon tax so the first point is that we estimate price elasticity at the micro level so we have like 36 elasticity according to different households or something like 10 uh, uh, elasticity according to different firms according to the sectors of the size of the firms and we estimate this price elasticity for, for all the fuel mix, so for uh, transport, for eating, for all the different way uh, they are using energy. Uh, then we uh, simulate a climate shock, so we change the price of each fuel according to the carbon content for different carbon taxes. We change, then we use the, est the, the estimated elasticity to recompute uh, the energy mix and also the new energy expenditure, if you want the counterfactual energy expenditure. We deduct this expenditure from the income of households and from the EBITDA of the, of the single firm, and then we assess uh, financial vulnerability. Uh, as I said before, I mean, issue of data here, if you want, there is also a lot of work in the paper on heavy micro data on energy demand. That is something that is unfortunately is, is lacking out there. So for households, we use this paper with, uh, that I, I, me and Luciano La Vecchia published last year that is just on households, it's households energy demand to look at what are the consequences of an introduction of carbon pricing in terms of redistributive effects. Uh, for financial vulnerability of households, we use these two uh, papers from Michelangelo and Pietro Antonio Michelangelo, Atina and Franceschi. And uh, for frame level, we use balance sheets from company account data system. We estimate the, the, the methodology for estimating the paper and for impu impute the energy demand is actually in the paper. And for financial vulnerability, we use the social Michelangelo. What is this base, this, this kind, this concept of financial vulnerability? We consider a household vulnerable if it's loan installment, installment to income, it's the ratio of uh, loans, the, the debt serv service ratio, if you want, exceed 30%, and its income is below the median. And the firm is, uh, is defined as vulnerable with a, a, a similar logic if the EBITDA is below zero or if the ratio of interest expenses to EBITDA is more than 50%. So we have these things. It's not exactly PD. Actually, there is a paper out there from Alessio, uh, from um, um, uh, Maria Alessia Aiello and Cristina Angelico that connected our model with a PD model uh, to have P sectorial PD that try to assess what is the effect of carbon taxation and PD. So this is the concept, if you, load, if you, if you want the, the outcome variable of our simulation, financial vulnerability. A and this is our shock. We uh, have four carbon taxes actually, 50, 100, 200, and 800 euros. These are uh, re in real terms, 2015 per ton of CO2. And we use the carbon content of each fuel to simulate the carbon tax. So we increase the price according, the real price accordingly to the different carbon tax. As I said before, we use estimated price elasticity to see how these carbon taxes impact demand, recompute the new energy expenditure, and then assess how this energy expenditure is impacting income uh, and profits. Uh, these are the results actually, so on, on, in blue on the right you have the baseline, so you have the share of vulnerable households and the share of vulnerable firms and the debt risk in the baseline, so case, the original case, so the world as it is actually for uh, constraints in data is 2016 for households, so why is uh, 2018 for firms, in the world without carbon taxation, and then you have on the left column the world with carbon taxation, 50 euro, uh, 100 euro, 200 euros, and 800 euros. So as you can see, 
uh, in terms of, uh, uh, these are uh, percentage changes compared to the baseline. Apart from the 800 euros, there's no much going on, in particular for households. There is more for firms in terms of uh, debt, debt at risk. Uh, these are uh, our estimates for elasticity. This is taken from uh, Faella and La Vecchia. As you can see, you, you have different elasticity. We have a pretty simple model, so it's uh, the, 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 the quantity of the fuel depends on the quantity in the past, plus the price and some other stuff. Uh, this, as I said before, are 36 elasticity. We did, we've done also some uh, uh, robustness check using IV and other estimates. And given the specification on the model, actually we have also long, uh, long run elasticity estimates. You can have more details uh, in, in the paper. But when, when we apply, just to give you the flavor of the idea of the method, when you apply these things, for example, to income, this is what happened you have uh, uh, for different age classes. Now this is the, the age class of the head of households. And you can see uh, how the income is impacted if you have uh, 50 euros carbon tax or if you have 100 on top of that or uh, 200. And so you, you have the, the change in income in percentage. The, we, this is just an example. We can use age class. We can use the, 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 the employment status or the, the household's number. Whatever information is available in, uh, at the survey level, there is rather detail. This is the household budget survey from the National Statistical Office. Uh, this is the specification for firm. We have less uh, in information over here. Again, uh, the specification of the model is more or less the same, but you can, as you can see, we have different elasticities for agriculture, industry, construction, services, and also uh, 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 according to the size of the, of the firm. Again, we can have the same information as before. We are showing here the sectorial uh, EBITDA. Uh, for agriculture, construction, industry, and services. The, I mean, the, the, this approach is nice because, I mean, you are considering the kind of energy mix, the kind of reaction of each fuel to each price. For example, as you can see, in construction, you don't have big effect because probably uh, the demand is rather rigid there and they are using mostly uh, um, uh, diesel and, and, and liquid fuels while not using other fuels that are more flexible, for example, for industry and services like power or natural gas. And this is, there is the same results if you want, looking at household financial, financial vulnerability. Uh, you have uh, on the bottom part of the figure, uh, the result for all. So you have the baseline and what, what, how much the, the uh, car different carbon taxation are, is changed in the baseline. Not much, as I said before. You have it for all the sample, uh, as you have also information, detailed information, for, again, for the age class of, uh, of the head of households or for the size of the household. This is the same for the firms. Uh, again, you have uh, uh, the effect for the total, for the size of the household, uh, of the firm, sorry, and the sector the firms is operating in. Uh, I, I go, I, I conclude. The point is that wh why, why, we why we do really like this approach? Well, uh, first, let me say there is something that is not in the slide. This, this approach can be used for an energy shock. Uh, we are analyzing a climate shock. We can use what happened uh, uh, lately, in, uh, uh, mid-2021, with the disruption in energy markets, and then with the measure of Ukraine. So it's rather uh, uh, flexible. And, and also, we, we really like the idea of having a portrait that, really, that is really faithful of what is out there. So uh, if you look at a given sector, as I said before, uh, if you look at manufacturing, you have a combination of power and gas. If you look at construction, you have a combination of liquid fuels and something else. If you look at certain part of the energy sector, probably coal kicks in. That's important because maybe this is not the case at, the pre at present, but you know, energy prices are different, maybe have different dynamics, maybe have different, and definitely have uh, resp responding a different way if you're introducing a carbon tax. So we think it's, that, that's, that it's really important to check what is the real energy mix out there. Um, again, this translation, this putting a carbon taxation is, is really what is discussed, the, the European Commission is discussing right now, for example, changing the energy directive, uh, put an excise that is uh, proportional to the carbon content of the fuel. So, again, this exercise is pretty realistic. Uh, 
and you know, it can also give you, given the uh, historical price, the, the fiscal space you had to introduce, for example, this carbon taxation. In some cases it will be doable, in other cases it would be just crazy to put again another stress on energy prices. I'm thinking about it and in particular where energy, uh, taxation on energy is pretty high compared to the uh, European average. Uh, and microdata, as I said before, uh, allow the, uh, the policy maker to look at what are the channels and when there are some factors, uh, I put here some examples for firms. Maybe this is important because the energy price is affecting uh, the export propensity, is affecting a sector that is more exporting or is affecting non tradable sector. This is going to make a big difference in terms of competitiveness now of their policy. And it's the same you think about what is the effect in terms of distribution, of income distribution, of expenditure distribution of households. So these are the pros, this is the, uh, the reason we really like this approach, but you know there are also a lot of weakness. Uh, this is all short term, this is all counterfactual, there is no possibility to adjust uh, and, and so uh, we should really take the results with uh, a lot of attention because in the long run maybe they are adjusting the energy mix, they are changing you know, the way they are using energy. It's just partial equilibrium so there's no effects of trade, there's no spillover from other sector and, and not interaction between sectors. And as I said before, there, are not, there is no dynamics. Uh, the extension actually, the extension the, well, where our colleagues uh, are estimating uh, the effects on sectoral PD using our models, they use dynamics. So you can use some kind of statistical approach to imagine what's going on in the next three years. So it's not a long, long time on time horizon like the one Laura showed us before. Uh, and we are also trying to have individual firm level PD to do, to do the same thing. So at the, at the PD level using this, what are called these internal rating models called ICAS, uh, the central banking, do the, this kind of shock in, uh, in the energy expansion and see what happened to individual PD. So this, this is something that I hope is going to be available uh, in, the, in the next year. Thanks a lot. I'm done. Thank you, Ivan, Mathilde, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go to the slides that are, oh, okay, thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to present to you the work that has been done by, the, by a study group on uh, biodiversity loss and financial stability. And this working group uh, was co-sponsored by the NGFS on the one side and the INSPIRE uh, Research Network that is a, a network working on financial stability and their, uh, its interactions with uh, climate change but also other environmental issues. So just a bit more context on this study group on, on biodiversity loss and financial stability. It was established um, last April, uh, well, April last year, uh, and it involved uh, 25 NGFS members and observers, but also uh, 28 research institutions with over more than, uh, well, over uh, 100 members. And it was co-chaired by Dr. Matt Jun from the NGFS and Nick Robbins, who's a professor at the London School of Economics and member of the Inspire Network. So um, three reports were, were published, and I'm going to focus on the final report that is the more extensive one that was published uh, last April, and I, you can see to the, to the right of the, of the screen. So the main question that is addressed in this report is why should central banks and supervisors care about biodiversity, um, biodiversity loss, more precisely, uh, in addition to, of course, paying attention to, to climate change. So just a few facts on, on biodiversity loss, just to remind that it's unprecedented in human history, uh, the IPBS published a very influential report in 2019 stating that the extinction rate of species is currently hundreds to thousand times higher than reference rates of the past million years. And approximately one quarter of species are already threatened with extinction. Um, and the problem is that the, the planetary boundary for, for biosphere integrity has been crossed and we know that crossing tipping, po tipping points could lead to uh, non-linear patterns and non-linear uh, disruptions in the functioning of the, of the biosphere uh, as explained before by, by also Professor Das Gupta ye yesterday. Um, and actually our economies and financial systems are embedded in nature, so biodiversity enables nature to be uh, productive, resilient and adaptable and it also allows nature to provide ecosystem services on which economic activities depend, and our economies and financial systems depend on, on these ecosystem services. 
So the World Bank published an uh, interesting report uh, uh, last year that estimates that annually uh, t uh, by 2030, if uh, we are in a scenario where there is a collapse of four ecosystem services, this would cost 2.3% of, of global GDP. And this is, of course, and they acknowledge this in this work, and this work is, is work in progress, but this is a conservative estimate as it does not account for the indirect losses across sectors and, and countries. And critically, what they found is that poor countries could lose up to 10% of their GDP per year uh, in such scenarios. So what are the financial stability uh, implications? Uh, the fact is that uh, economic activities on the one hand depend on nature and ecosystem services, but also impact uh, nature. So the dependency of uh, economic activity on ecosystems may bring exposure to physical risk and that could result from the degradation of these ecosystem services on which uh, economic activities depend. So just to, to give a, a little example of such ecosystem services, um, we know that a very large part of uh, global uh, crop production depends on animal uh, pollination and uh, another type of ecosystem service that could be disrupted is the regulation of disease and the IPBS is warning us that we could enter an era of pandemics and this could have of course major, uh, major impacts on our economy. But on the other hand, um, economic activities may also have negative impacts on biodiversity and on ecosystems which could bring exposure to transition risks resi resulting from the misalignment between the, the firm's impact on biodiversity and future developments aiming towards achieving a nature positive economy. So, for example, we can think about changes in consumer preferences, changes in technologies to protect nature, but also, of course, regulations. Um, and to give uh, an idea of such regulation, the global biodiversity framework that is currently being discussed during COP15 um, would extend uh, the, the range of protected areas, so the size of protected areas on, on the land and on sea, and the Dutch Central Bank uh, produced a work estimating that if we move to 30% of land and sea in protected areas, this would double the exposure of Dutch financial institutions to such areas. But there could also be uh, regulations in various sectors, like in the agricultural sector or uh, construction sectors, for example. So just to sum up, uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the, of, the, of the slide you see that there are these uh, physical and transition sources of risk that could then impact firms, households and states and then trickle down to uh, the financial system just like for, for climate change. So what are uh, options for actions? So this report also uh, looked at the, the, the options we have, uh, for, well, central banks have. Um, and uh, it takes stock of the fact that central banks and other institutions are actually starting to assess the exposure of financial institutions in their jurisdictions to uh, the physical risks uh, on the one side and the transition risks on the other side. And to do so, they assess to what extent uh, these financial institutions uh, finance activities in sectors that have uh, large dependencies on ecosystem services for physical risk, but also large impacts on uh, biodiversity and ecosystems for, for transition risk. And here you can see uh, an example like that is in the, in the report that uh, such work has been done by uh, the, Nedel, the, the Dutch Central Bank, but also French Central Bank, Brazilian, Malaysia, and, and Mexico. Um, so this is the, really the start of the assessment, but it provides a, a baseline for prioritizing further action. And the final report also provides other examples of actions that are already uh, taken by central bank uh, regarding the well, more prudential aspects, uh, the elaboration of taxonomies, uh, disclosure, and uh, how central bank integrate biodiversity in the, the management of their own portfolio. And finally, to, to conclude, following on this uh, joint NGFS inspire uh, final report, the NGFS issued a statement on nature-related financial risk that acknowledges that nature-related risk, including those associated with biodiversity loss, could have significant macroeconomic implication and that failure to account for mitigates 
and adapt to this implication is a source of risk relevant uh, to, for financial stability. So um, nature-related financial risks should be considered by central banks and supervisors for the fulfillment of their, of their mandate. And this has led to the creation of an NGFS task force that will try to mainstream uh, the considerations on, on nature-related risks, biodiversity-related risks, across the various uh, NGFS work streams. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much again. And I would now leave the floor to Lars. Um, so, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so, I, I hope by my earlier conversation that I agree that climate change is a very important problem to be addressed and one that's, and, and um, so my comments here are not so much about climate change as being an important policy problem for society, but what's the role of central banks in terms of addressing it um, and, and trying to understand what their appropriate and, 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 and best well-conceived role is. Um, so. So always confronting policy uncertainty, I always think there's this tension between limited understanding of mechanisms and demand for precise answers by the public. And the latter one leads, leads us to want to you know, take actions to do things now and, and, and the like. And, and, and sometimes we're, so we're in this position of, do, of facing that demand when, when there's limits to our understanding. Um, so, why, so, so some important considerations, I think, when I think about the role of central banks. I, I certainly think of from, from a fiscal side, you know, we can talk about carbon taxation, we can talk about subsidies to R&D and all like that, but you know, these are important ways to directly confront the climate change externalities. So how about central banks and central bank regulations? So we kind of, we kind of so the first, we certainly agree that historical measurements alone have limited values, and this is pushing economies into realms they haven't yet to experience. But the concern, more generally, is that we have hastily divided prob, uh, you know, policies unsupported by credible quantitative modeling that could backfire and even harm reputations of central banks. Um, so it's, it's any stated climate change ambitions really might generate unwarranted comp confidence in the ability of central banks to address a, a, an important problem when indeed their toolkit to do so is relatively limited. Um, so I've talked before, and I just want to kind of reemphasize that do, I like to think about this from the standpoint of dynamics and decision theory. Okay? And, um, and, and we, we see lots of discussions about risk, transition risk, physical risk, and the like. But which of these are ones we really can credibly assign probabilities to? Which, which are the ones we struggle with? Which are, which are the ones we know very little about? And, and I think those type of that, that has to be factored in, the, in, in a direct and explicit way into this in, in these discussions. Moreover, I think it's important that we consider formulations that are explicitly dynamic and kind of recursive in nature, ones in which we entertain the possibility that as we're looking at financial institutions, information is going to arrive in the future that's going to, uh, that, 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 that we want them to be responding to. They're not going to tie their hands now or what they're going to do for the next 30 years because they're, they're going to be making certain forms of dynam dynamic responses, and that's going to depend on what information we think might be available in the future. And that, should, that has to factor into our, our th thinking here. So ag again, I want to just uh, talk talked about before, these uncertainty trade-offs. We want financial institutions we regulate as well as policymakers to be thinking about, about how much weight we assign to best guesses, to potentially bad outcomes. Do we act now? Do we wait until we learn more and, and the like? And so, what, so it seems to me that when we're looking at trying to evaluate and assess financial institutions, we need to take this kind of more per, di, you know, dynamic perspective, and, um, especially as we look over longer horizons. What does it mean for the, our, the financial institution to be doing sensible things? Um, uh, and so I, um, so I really kind of find this to be, that this dynamic perspective to be useful. So th there's lots of discussions about these notions of physical risk. I like to think about these more generally because I think it's hard to quantify some of these. Climate, you know, the physical risks include things like climate sensitivity, environmental tipping points, 
transition risks, damages, and adaptation, perhaps, and perhaps new, new green technologies might come down the road. The other thing that's really interesting here is um, transition risk, I, I would agree, is something that firms have to you know, face. So a lot of that, in the short run, comes from policy uncertainty, which means that the regulators in, the, in this position of trying to assess whether the, uh, uh, the, the banks are regulating are actually uh, make, take, you know, taking the right contingencies when they face uncertainties elsewhere in the government. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting place to put the central bank. Uh, but anyway, given difficulties in quantification, I, I, I really think it's good to think in, in, in these broader terms, and that's going to uh, carry all the way in terms of how we measurement, measure things. I don't think we can just lift, lift you know, take off-the-shelf methods that have been used by, by, you know, by financial institutions and elsewhere for, uh, for uncertainty, uh, for risk measurements and apply them in this setting. Um, so, so financial stability is certainly a very interesting question. Um, so after the financial crisis, there's a lot of discussions about so-called systemic risk. Right? And systemic risk was there, there was, uh, uh, in terms of financial crisis, is something that evolved relatively quickly. It's something that unfolded in a relatively short period of time. Um, the, our models, our macroeconomic models at the time, really were not, most of them were not really well suited quantitatively to address this. And we're still trying to figure out ways to, to address the financial stability challenges at a macro level uh, it, uh, that, that are fully model based. Integrating climate change into that type of understanding is certainly going to be a challenge, but one in which I think we have a long ways to go. So this really puts on the table over what time scale should we seek to quantify climate change uncertainty. This is very different than financial crises. Financial crises unfold quickly. Climate change is something that we think is going to unfold over longer time periods. Th and, and therefore, we have to, in terms of financial stability, I would say we really have to think about it in rather fundamentally different terms. Yeah. Um, now, What's the role for regulation and supervision? So this is kind of a well-defined role of central banks and the banking sector. Um, here I find it very useful to draw a distinction. This distinction is um, uh, in asset pricing, there's often discussions of systematic risk. So what is systematic risk? As I say, I, I, s systematic risk is where there's macro shocks that affect the entire financial system. And then asset pricing doesn't view that as some type of... Um, social problem it imbues as something that's solved by prices by market prices that occur in financial markets and the theory of asset pricing that then goes and says are we are those uh, uh, you know builds models about the pricing of those type of macroeconomic shocks systemic uncertainty is it is um, meant to be something where there's some form of externality and so when we're talking about climate change and, uh, and biodiversity and the like from the standpoint of regulation how do we want to distinguish that from other macro shocks? Do we want the central ba banks to be uh, uh, um, looking at across all type of macro uh, shocks, or do we want them just to be featuring certain types? And, and, and then what leads us to look at certain types? So in thinking about this, one thing that I think would come to mind, and, and, and this comes to do, to do with the fact of the lack of historical evidence. Arguably, for other macro shocks, we have better historical evidence. And so, and so, and so, so therefore, we may be more reliable, you know, may, you know, may rely more on the kind of market prices and, and, and market signals to do the job. For, th for things like climate change, biodiversity, and the like, there may be a systemic concern that the private sector collectively underestimates the magnitudes of exposure to climate change. So maybe that's what really differentiates climate change uh, from the standpoint of regulation from, from other sources of macroeconomic shocks. And I, got, and I think a credible argument can be made along those lines. But then it seems to me like more work needs to be done by regulators and regulated on really figuring out credible ways to quantify what we mean by exposure to climate change uh, as a macro shock. I mean, uh, this is stuff which we're at that, uh, the early stages of. There's lots of speculation about how to do this. And maybe the first steps have to be we ha have to make sure that regulators and regulated are on the same page. And, and, and when we saw the discussions about top-down versus bottom-up, I think that's to some extent uh, are getting at issues like this. But, but to me, one has to go back to the basic measurements of the, you know, of the exposures and, 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 and kind of are we doing them in sensible ways. So I think it's important to embrace a broad notion of, of uncertainty. And then we have to come up with a prudent and agreed-upon ways to measure these climate change exposures.
one, ones that are credible both from the standpoint of the regulator, the regulated as well as science, uh, as, well, um, uh, um, as well as well scientific as well indeed. And I think there's much work, to, what much very important work to come that can be done there. So I, so I view this as a push beyond what's currently envisioned by policymakers. There's another is, in, interesting, interesting part of regulation that I think that's uh, shown up elsewhere, and I think it c can carry over here as, as, as you're thinking about how we want to regulate these financial firms. Whose models we use for assessing these exposures? This is where I think commonly agreed upon uh, uh, measurements become important. Uh, there's an, you know, uh, an earlier work done by Bang, Hasselman, and Big about the limits of model-based regulation under, under which they're looking at the um, uh, po you know, policies under which uh, banks could have their choice as to whether they uh, um, lie on the regulated, the regulators' models or or their own models in, in order to do so-called risk assessment, and, and 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 you know not surprisingly there were kind of distortions or you know, you know that showed up when you write to rely too heavily on the uh, uh, on, on, on the model based on the models based on the, the firms being regulated. So scenarios. Um, it's been very interesting to watch the scenario development. And there's little doubt that the, uh, the, 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 the climate-based scenarios have become ri you know, richer over time, more interesting, uh, more, more extensive, and I think these are all very positive developments. Um, the question is how far you can go from thinking about climate change in terms of macroeconomic fluctuations and the like without really putting on the table not only scenarios but probabilities. How far can we not you know, talk about how plausible the scenarios are probabilistically? Uh, there's an initial uh, attempt on, on, on stress tests to avoid, to avoid use of probability. The probabilities are used in constructing the scenarios themselves, but, but in terms of um, looking, at their, uh, looking at cross scenarios, probabilistic reasoning plays very, plays very little role. And this, I think, can, can become problematic. I, I, it, it becomes, it limits the value of the answers, I think, that one can get out of coming on a stress test. And so I, so I hope down the road that, they, that, 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 they, that there's some more probabilistic thinking can come into play there. Um, it, the original aims was, you know, you know, one can imagine when you're doing some type of um, stress test for, for, um, some uh, for some financial crisis, one could, that plays out over a short time period, you could say, well, suppose X happens, what will you do? But suppose X happens over 30 years, then you have sort of have to have, have to ask them what else happens over 30 years, and then you know, you know what information comes down the lo road on 30 years, and, and the like. You have to. You know, I think the, the dynamic perspective cannot be avoided, and, and and I think probabilities cannot really be avoided. Maybe there are probability bounds, maybe, but, but but I think probabilistic reasoning across the scenarios has to play a bigger role, as well as implications for for say future information. Um, Again, you know, we, on certain trade-offs, you know, um, we, we want the firms being regulated to face these uncertainty trade-offs. We, uh, we want them to be making sensible decisions that trade off potential bad outcomes versus um, uh, sensible things under uh, other states of the world. So in, in order to regulate sensibly, we have to look across those different, uh, um, you know, different ranges of possi possibilities and probabilistically. But, the, but then these issues about do we act now or do we wait until we learn? Um, if you give a, a financial institution a 30-year scenario, where, where does that come into play? Where are they allowed to say, well, down the road we may find out this, and so therefore, th 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 and, th th and, then, and, then and, and so we're going to wait. So, so, so some of our actions will be contingent on information we get to observe in the future. So, so I think it's important that these scenario-based stress tests get more probabilistically, dynamically, and dynamic, and and, um, and in some sense more recursive. Um, so, yeah, right now I just don't. You know, there's some, these important lessons from a dynamic decision theory. I just don't really see how to confront them in the context of th of of of, of, uh, of long-term stress tests. The thing what you don't want to do, and and and, and presumably. You know, and presumably, this you know, regulators are well aware of this when, the, when, when they look at answers. Is if you tell me a 30 year scenario and I'm allowed to condition on that scenario, I can do some wonderful things because I know the future. So, how do we? So, what's the sense in which we have to look across scenarios and, and in some sense, which ones are more plausible than others? Um, now, I think stress tests can be very useful as is, 
just to get financial firms or, and uh, be thinking about climate change. And, and maybe this gets it on their radar screen, and that alone is a, is a big part of the success story. Um, just a, some other type of arguments that haven't come up in these presentations here, but uh, in other discussions, people have talked about, well, maybe we should be putting pressure on firms to be, financial firms to be l lending more to, uh, you know, based on green investments and the like. Uh, and, and, wh and what's the potential role of central banks for embracing things like green mandates? There is um, some social, there is some kind of calculations of the social potency of such, pro uh, of, of such policies when well executed. There's kind of a nice paper here by Hong, Wang, and Yang that I give about the welfare consequences of sustainable finance. There's a more, um, uh, uh, more focused role of this, these type of discussions in this paper by Patitsi, Piers Eshi, and Schneider about uh, um, uh, unconventional, how unconventional is green monetary policy. Um, so they investigate the potentially important role that might tilt towards green production. And, and maybe that's a role for central banks to engage in to try to help help slant things towards green production instead of you know, engaging in direct subsidies. But um, the caution there is the following. Current ESG env uh, environmental, social, and governance portfolio standards are really problematic. They open the door to gamesmanship, undermining the socially productive consequences. Um, the, 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 uh, from the standpoint of financial economics, the risk-adjusted expected return loss that ESG investing has been notoriously hard to estimate. And, the esti uh, and, th and this is in part because of limits to our historical data. A and it, 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 there's substantially different findings across other alternative different studies. Um, the real impact of ESG investing has also been uh, challenging to uncover. There's this interesting paper by um, Emma Ingram and Herta that actually show that the ESG firms that get identified as ESG firms, if you look at their future um, uh, uh, emissions trajectories in terms of growth rates are really not that much different than, uh, of a, at least from a, growth from a growth rate perspective from other, e um, from other firms. To me, even more concerning or, or interesting is the unintended consequences of a policy like this. A substantial amount of the green patenting right now is done by firms with low, uh, with low ESG scores. So basically, if you squash down on ESG type, uh, um, uh, if, if you have higher high ESG scores, you run the risk of, of squashing the same, of, 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 of slanting, or of, of pu pulling resources away from firms that are actually engaged in the uh, R&D activities. So I think there's a, you know, th this kind of tilting portfolio of green is, you know, is something that might sound intriguing. As I say, it's played no role in the, in, in the conversation here, but, you know, but more generally, what role, what, what should central banks' role be in this in correcting and enforcing this? Of, of course, they could do much a better job. You know, perhaps they could do a better job of the standards, but still there's this issue about uh, uh, the, the screen patenting that I, that, uh, that I think is important to consider. So let, just to summarize, um, I, I, uh, the, you know, the, the type of scenario analysis out there is be becoming richer. It's becoming more interesting. But, but I think it's sooner or later one has to ask What's, um, what, question, what are sensible ways uh, uh, or help, what, what are sensible responses to, to climate scenarios um, without probabilities? I think you do have to push more into type, uh, to, to, to some type of probabilistic assessments of things. I think un quantifying uncertainty in climate change and um, uh, biodiversity and the like does create special challenges. And, and these are missed by commonly used risk-based methods. So maybe that's the s scope of s some type of um, special rule for oversight. Um, more generally, understand the sources of subjective uncertainty and limitations of models used by both regulated and regulators will make oversight more effective. Um, I, I like to say sometimes more can be accomplished by, uh, by trying to do less. Thank you. Okay. Is this working? Let's try. No. Okay. Great. Uh, so thank you so much to, to all of you uh, for these interesting presentations. What I would do maybe is uh, to have a, 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 the, the second round of interventions by central bankers, and there's a lot to uh, react uh, from uh, Lars's presentation. Um, of course, I would 
like to hear your opinion if uh, you want uh, about the limitations on stress testing methodologies that were pointed out. And more in general, then I would transition to the uh, policy part uh, of the panel where also uh, limitations were pointed out. So uh, I guess the main question that I have for you, you know, heavily involved uh, in this discussion within central banks is how do you see the current state of the discussion of the debate within central banks? How is the environment? How is it evolving? And where do you see it um, in the future? Sorry, shall we start from you? Uh, I'm yeah, that's totally fine. No, thanks a lot. Um, and I would like to really thank uh, once again Professor Hansen for the very, let's say, insightful uh, presentation and remarks. It's always very useful, I think, also for us central bankers to have exchanges at this very high level to uh, drive us towards taking, uh, let's say, healthy policy solutions at the end. So I, I think the problem of um, taking policy decisions under, under uncertainty is one of the key questions that we have also asked ourselves for, and we are still asking ourselves how to get about it. Um, and I would like to, to flag that um, from a central banking perspective, and here I'm also taking a little bit closer look at the ECB, when trying to address this question, we, have, we are dealing with a problem with multiple constraints. So on the one hand, we have constraints in terms of mandate. So we are institutions that have clear objectives that have to be met. On the second, uh, uh, second point is that we have limitations that we have to deal with in terms of data and modeling. Uh, third, we have, um, despite, let's say, roles and responsibilities, uh, we also have to deal with the urgency of the matter. So when starting a little bit with the mandate, we at the ECB, for example, have two. One is price stability, and the second one, without prejudice to price stability, is the fulfillment of the EU treaty that also imply, let's say, a protection of the environment. And climate change, as well as biodiversity, have a strong impact on both. So we are called to really act on climate change and biodiversity risks to really like fulfill our, our mandates. Otherwise, we are, we are not complying. So we have to do something uh, like because institutionally we are obliged to do so. Secondly, in terms of roles and responsibilities, while it is true that climate policies are, are implemented by governments and it's with them the primary responsibility, uh, it is also true that each of us has to play his own part if we really want to go ahead and solve this issue somehow. So we are not shy at the ECB in saying that we also take on our shoulders our, our own role and responsibility to really try to act here, of course complying with our, with our mandate. And when dealing with the climate data and modeling limitations, on, on the other hand, we also do not have to forget that if we want to mitigate climate change, the, the window, let's say, of opportunity is closing. So either we start doing something now or whatever we are going to do in a few years is not going to be useful at all because it's going to be too late. So with these multiple constraints problem, it's really, I mean, we're really trying to find our way through all of this to try to find balanced uh, policy options. And the solution that we, are, uh, that we found so far is to have, let's say, a pragmatic on the one hand, but also adjustable policy approach. What I mean with this is that um, at the ECB, we are trying to, to, to ask or to, to solve these policy problems. First of all, trying to deal with the data we have available right now and use the currently available data uh, in, in our modeling framework to, to see how to best proceed in, in terms of policy reactions but in a way that we can adjust and adapt and update our policy reactions as soon as new data and new models become available. So this is exactly the way we are going about it. Uh, so to, to really try to be very pragmatic here, not taking the next five years talking about what's the best data or model to use, but really trying to see how we can update and adjust as soon as we go forward um, in, in this regard. Talking about the international context or the European context, and then I will leave the floor <laughs> to Ivan, of course. I mean, I think that a lot has been done over the last two, three, four years in, in the policy context and in the central banking community. Um, I don't know for other central banks, but talking about the ECB, before the NGFS was established in 2017, work 
on, on this topic was limited, if not completely absent. And I think in five years, four or five years, we've really done a lot of steps forward into this direction. In the NGFS context, first of all, that really like goes in the entire spectrum of central banking activities and tasks. But also right now we are starting also in regulatory bodies to talk about uh, possible um, amendments in, uh, in uh, the prudential framework to supervise, to better supervise banks, to increase um, uh, disclosures. That is basically the, that is probably the first uh, uh, question that we're trying to answer right now to increase also the quality and availability of, of data. Um, and uh, let's say in the, in the international context about, uh, about re reporting standards uh, to also ensure consistency across several jurisdictions. So I have to say the level of coordination across institutions in, in, this, uh, in this field has, uh, really been, been, has really increased substantially and I'm quite optimistic that, uh, uh, that uh, even more steps will be done in the next years. Thanks, Laura. Uh, well, I would say uh, thanks very much, Lars, for the very interesting presentation. I, I would start from what is a, what the outside world is expecting from the financial system, from central bank in particular. Laura said, I mean, we are not in an ICO environment. We cannot fix carbon prices. We, the, the, it's important that we play our role, but honestly, we, uh, I, I think that there was a, a strategy from Commission in particular to be very strong on uh, what the financial system should do, but very weak, if I may, <laughs> on what substantially was uh, policy were delivering in terms of uh, carbon pricing, in terms of you know shutting down calls in this kind of stuff. This is important because I mean you don't have to give the impression that you know you're not doing renewables because the cost of capital is too high. That's not the case. I mean renewables are not out there because of regulation, because network, because you know many other practical st stuff. So this, this is important because you get the impression that, you know, now you are in, uh, raising the interest rates or your uh, transition is not going to happen because of that. But th that's not the reality. No, it's the other way around. I mean, you have a project because it's possible and then you are financing that. Um, and unfortunately, I would say also one problem of the European strategy was the lack of a statistical initiative accompanying the strategy. I mean, so we do not much uh, not about what's going to happen because you know flooding in the next 10 years we don't know almost anything about how we as a community use energy we don't have uh, uh, micro data on energy use we don't have uh, detailed data on energy prices and expenditure historical data so it's very difficult to imagine how you have to assess what's happening in the future where, where you cannot even have you know, basic information what was happening right now. I'm telling this uh, as an economist. If you compare that, we you know with uh, um, the labor market or, or I don't know, poverty, inclusion, this kind of stuff. Man, you have hundreds of data sets out there, uh, precise, published by the statistical agencies, so uh, a very uh, of high quality data. So this is lacking, and, and that was, I think, it's a problem. That said, I mean then we have to stop and wait for perfection, not at all. I mean, uh, as a central bank, we do a lot of stuff. And so we can consider also this issue of the transition and sustainability at large in our, in the things we are doing. We are supervisors, so we can increase awareness. Uh, uh, we are investors, so we can change our model of investing our own money, no monetary portfolios, to consider this issue. That is, you know, both uh, climate risks uh, in the past and in the future. We know the ESG has a we, the guy that are using ESG, they know that they are, they are not appropriate funds to use. That you should not use it for that. But you know, there are other smarter way to use that. You can build these things. Maybe to consider also the use of natural resources. So if we want, in a sense, going uh, towards the earth, Matilda was saying. Then we are doing research. We are producing data. So that again, that that's an idea also to, for example, to have uh, um, estimates of the exposure of I don't know of credit of loans. Uh, Laura, uh, Laura before told us you know there was also some policy. And then we are, uh, bottom line, we are a firm. So we are using tea, eating, cooling. Uh, we are producing, uh, some central banks do, uh, uh, notes, so bank notes. So we, we, we can, as a firm, being you know aware ourselves regarding what we are asking, for example, the bank or, or non-financial firms to do, like transition plans, if there is the possibility to go to net zero, if there is policy or strategy. So there are issues out there. Uh, things are not perfect, but you can do something. 
Uh, I completely agree that providing specific quantitative uh, statements of what are the risk, I mean, uh, I've done it before, but you, you saw in the presentation that I was pretty skeptical regarding giving this precise number. I mean, they can pro get, provide the impression to the public that you know, we know, we know better, we know what's going to happen in 2030. That, that's not true. Uh, we, we, I mean, there was Powell uh, yesterday said, we don't know nothing about inflation, <laughs> so <laughs> let's imagine about climate change. So I think that that's useful because it's important to be honest, so to do the, our best with the informative set is uh, uh, available at the moment. Uh, but we are learning a lot. Uh, I really I agree completely with Laura. I think NGFS really was a game changer because it's, it's in part what Lars was suggesting, you know, a collect collective action, uh, trying to get the, the most uh, what, you know, what is out there. Uh, and we are learning, for example, as central bankers, that there is not just the labor market. So we are using the Phillips curve, and we look at you know, our wages, inflation, and we have a grasp of you know, uh, productive capacity and if we are, have to increase uh, interest rates or not. It's not the simple. There are, you know, energy is in very important markets. Oil is not enough to have, a, 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 a imagine what, what happened to oil in 2021 and what happened to gas, no? If you was the, the, the thing was completely different. Renewables are a new part of the story. So it's very important that we, you know, in building our models, in building our analysis, analysis we consider also these things. So in a, in a sense, looking at the climate issue and looking at the energy issue is this. Uh, it's very similar. It's not the same thing, it's very similar, and now we have this uncertainty that we don't know if these things that is happening now is a looming transition risk, so it's increasing transition risk in the future, or it's just stop the transition. I, I really believe, but that's my personal opinion, that uh, I mean transition is unstoppable because of what's happening out there, and you know, climate change is not going to stop because we decide that we now have more important things to uh, think about it. But if that's for sure, we know that energy security, energy affordability is going to be a new issue in next years to come. So it's important because in a sense, I think that this uh, uh, learning because of climate issues uh, is going to uh, be super useful now that we have to face the energy crisis because we know more, we know better, and hopefully we're going to be useful. Can it work? Oh, yeah, great. Um, so maybe I'm going to give a bit more insight on the, the biodiversity side because that's where uh, uh, I work, that's what I work on. Uh, but I think on biodiversity, we'll, it's really like the beginning. And as you said, Laura, a lot has been done for climate in a few, like five, two, five years, like four, five years. So hopefully the same is going to be achieved for nature related risk. Um, but I think we can, like the advantage we have now on, on biodiversity is that we can build on all the climate work that has already been done and what you presented, uh, Ivan, on, on vulnerabilities, uh, the question of scenario building and also the question of uncertainty is also uh, very, very similar. So hopefully we can also build on what has previously been done for, for climate change, but there are also new challenges in terms of, of data and, and models uh, because as I, uh, so I've presented the, the World Bank model and to my knowledge, it's maybe the only like type of model that is trying to integrate ecosystem services into uh, a macro framework and also trying to integrate uh, possible policy interventions, trying to protect nature and not all only fight against uh, climate change. So there are, things are moving fast, but uh, the, this raises new, new challenges. And to that respect, um, the, the task force that is going to be um, working on, on nature-related risk uh, at, the, at the NGFS is going to try to think how biodiversity can diffuse into uh, the, the various uh, NGFS work streams, so on monetary policy, but also on, on scenario analysis. And just to, to launch a few ideas and, and you think about the, the challenges, that what I've presented so far is um, Th there were some uh, studies made by central banks on the exposure of uh, financial institutions to uh, um, biodiversity-related financial risk, but it's, all, it's so far very static, so there is no dynamic dimension, and we don't say anything about how ecosystem services are going to evolve and what the transition policies with respect to nature 
are going to be, so there is work uh, to do uh, on this field, and I think this is what the, the task force on nature-related financial risk is, is going to do. So, yeah, the, the so far, I think there is a lot to do on, on, on research, and hopefully in five years we'll, we'll be where we are now on, on climate change. I mean, I guess just very briefly, I mean, it's only, to me, again, I can kind of reemphasize what's special from a reg regulatory standpoint from my, uh, uh, from my view is that um, the measurement challenge and, and the measurement challenge faced by both regulators, regulated, and, and, and trying to find better common ground there. Um, I, I think we've got further, I think we've got a ways to go b before we find that common ground. I, do we really know how to measure well physical risk? Transition risk, a lot of it, to the extent that has to do with policy uncertainty. Uh, are, we, are we really on the same page as the type of policy uncertainties which these financial inf institutions are facing? I think, I think the central banks are in an awkward position to even talk about policy uncertainty because they're talking about uncertainty generated by other components of government and they're trying to cooperate with government to accomplish something. So it's probably even a bit of an awkward conversation to have. Um, but to me, that, that's, that's a very important starting point. I can understand that different central banks have different mandates and 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 and, um, and, 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 and that climate change and like the, that can be part of a mandate but that still leaves open the question what the right way to address the mandate is and um, I guess I'm less concerned about the scenarios and, and as stress tests um, I have my skepticism about how much can really be learned about them for the reasons which I gave uh, to the extent that it starts pushing central banks into doing tilting uh, looking at financial institutions and putting pressure on them to tilt their investment, uh, their portfolios green, then I start getting more nervous. And, uh, but, but that's not something which we've talked about here, but that's something that's at least on the, uh, on the radar screen. And, and um, that, that I find somewhat more problematic. So. so thank you again to all. I would like now to open the floor for questions or, or comments. So, it's hard to see, oh, there's Nico up there and there's another, yeah, you can start by here. Maybe we can collect a few and, uh, and then we can have another round. Um, hi. Um, my name is Ilan Noy, I'm chairing the Economics of Disasters at Victoria University in Wellington in New Zealand. Um, question for Professor Hansen. Um, you seem to, when I was a, um, coaching my kids soccer, um, I was told that I should always give the kids a compliment, then criticize them, and then give them a compliment. That's the only way they can listen. You did the, exactly the opposite. You, crit you were critical of central banks for doing what seems to me to you imply too much. And then you gave a lot of reasons, which I think we all can agree on, why there's a lot of uncertainty around um, climate action. And then you were critical at the very last um, sentence that you were um, giving in your talk. You seem to have implied that um, somehow not doing anything is ontologically superior to doing something. Um, we know that we have a problem in climate change, and you agree with that with that statement, I think. Um, and we don't think, know exactly what we need to do, and you seem to prefer the, the, the not doing anything to doing something. Um, and I don't see any reason why we should, we should do that, and I'm happy to hear if, um, what's, you know, what do you say about that? Thank you. Is there another question um, up there, Nico? Sorry, I, sh I, I, sh I should wait and respond at the end to this? Or? Uh, as you prefer, I would collect maybe a few questions okay, so that we can fine. have another. Okay. I'll wait. Okay. I, I definitely want to respond to this one. Oh, because yeah, yeah. Because, because I've been misrepresented. So. <laughs> yes, uh, Nico. Great. Um, so thank you very much for the interesting session. Nik Nico Jarkalo from here from University of Bologna. Um, so Professor Hansen um, raised this point about about um, transition risk being essentially due to the deliberate decisions of policymakers. Um, maybe now, but probably more likely in the future. 
and decisions made today by firms, um, households, governments, and financial regulators will affect the constraints of future policymakers de deciding on, for example, carbon taxes. So should financial regulators take this sort of political influences on future regulators, future policymakers into account? Is that somehow within the mandate or not? Thank you. is uh, Francisco Alpiza, I'm um, Professor of Economics uh, at Wagen University. Um, I have uh, two related questions. First, uh, I would like you to comment on, on the interaction between climate change and biodiversity loss in, in the context of regulating central banks uh, and potential synerg synergies in policy design, but also potential trade-offs. My second comment is that although I agree with what you said that there has been a lot done when it comes to climate that can be um, taken into the biodiversity, uh, um, uh, let's say, context, uh, there are also uh, uh, big differences. And there is one in particular that is very well exemplified by, by pollinator uh, collapse or pollinator loss, and that is that where very few people will, will uh, doubt that climate change is a systemic risk uh, that, that we all share, many people seem to, to believe that, for example, pollinator loss is uh, not that systemic. It's something that could happen, I don't know, let's say in Ghana or in Indonesia, but that not necessarily affecting other countries or, or other continents. And uh, I, I was wondering how that is being, those differences, uh, if you can also point out some other differences between the two, the two challenges. speak? Yeah. Can. Well, f first of all, I cannot uh, resist uh, the temptation to comment on the first question, uh, because I believe that climate change and biodiversity loss are externalities. And, and we basically know that externalities is not something that uh, can be successfully addressed by monetary policy. So having to control an externality, for me, it's more of a fiscal problem. Uh, so if we put the, bud, the, the burden on the central bank to solve the problem and we let the government and the other regulators out, I think uh, maybe we put the wrong emphasis on who is going to address the problem. But th that's my comment. My question has to do basically with the trade-offs that the central bank has to face given the mandates. I mean, we know that the basic mandate is financial stability, stop inflation, and inflation started creeping up now, and interest rates are going up. Uh, on the other hand, the other mandate to protect the environment means that if we try to look at the social cost of carbon and take into account uh, ambiguity aversion and the, 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 the evidence that we saw today, uh, one ton of carbon that is not emitted is valued a lot, which means that we need to promote renewables or other kinds of things. But if we want to fight inflation in the short run and we increase interest rates, how these mandates uh, can be combined? What's the trade-offs? How, how the people from the central banks comment on the trade-offs between uh, the mandates? Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Andrea Alpero from the Central Bank of Colombia. Um, um, so my question goes a little bit in line with that one uh, in the context of this complementarity between the fiscal policy and the monetary policy. So what do you think uh, should countries that depend on oil um, in order to you know, have a monetary policy that supports this transition to greener uh, forms of energy but at the same time, this transition can hurt uh, the national oil companies and plummet their stock, which is very important for public finances at these countries. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, maybe we can go in reverse order. order. We can start with Lars and go back here. Uh, sure. Um, I'm going to be 
I'm going to be somewhat quick here. It's very clear from my earlier talk that uncertainty, I think, can actually lead you to be things like higher, potentially higher social cost of carbon, and, and, and uncertainty in certain cases wants you to act on the possibility of bad outcomes rather than uh, having to know them for sure. So I, I, I don't see uh, uncertainty, the, 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 the connection between uncertainty to uh, leading to an action, and, and, and that's certainly not my intention. I, th I think the quote that is, that, that, that is being referred to as the last one, what John said, is not that you can do nothing. I say sometimes you can accomplish more by trying to do less, which is certainly a very different statement than, 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 than therefore you should do nothing. Um, I think sometimes if you're overly ambitious in terms of what you state you want to do, um, you, 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 you can end up not really accomplishing as much as you might, might, might if you have a little bit less ambitious goal, which you, which you, could, which you can address in a more credible way. And that was, the, that was the thought process behind that statement, and it's it was certainly not a statement that we shouldn't be doing anything. I, I find, um, from an outsider perspective, of course I'm not involved in central banks, the, the one thing that's been about about central banks is at least is that they've had research departments that are very very much open much more open than uh, 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 than to than academic influences to uh, serious research analyses and 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 that to me has been a very very plus a plus side of things at least in the U.S. I think it's probably true more generally that central banks have been more immune to uh, political pressure and, and and I think that has also been a plus in terms of some of the uh, various different. More credibility because of their somewhat more distance for, from the political arena, but I do think we have, have to keep our eye. We, ha we have to be cognizant of what the central banks can really hope to accomplish or not accomplish. And my skepticism about the stress test was: yes, I can understand how stress tests might be useful as a way to get climate change um, on the radar screen of certain financial institutions. But if you, I, it was, but if you really want to take it to a place where you you want to assess our, our the financial institution is doing something sensible, I think you're going to have to put more structure in the stress test. And stress, I know that's not a statement of inaction, but rather a statement of, uh, of, of, of kind of a future research traject or a future improvements that can be made in policy. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to sort of answer the, the, the question on, on biodiversity, just that to say that I completely agree with um, what you said on the, the synergies between, th so there are synergies between climate change and biodiversity and also uh, trade-offs. And there was uh, an interesting report by the IPCC and the IPBS together uh, saying that because you have um, pressures on biodiversity that are due to climate change, but also the fact that um, biodiversity and biodiversity loss has impacts on, on greenhouse gas emissions and mainly through land use change and maybe to that respect looking at land use change could be like sort of a focal point to capture both the, the climate impact, uh, the climate aspect and the, the biodiversity aspect. Um, and also on the fact that um, uh, there could be some more local uh, dimension to biodiversity than systemic. Uh, maybe pollinator is, is not the best example, but we also know that there are some what we could call systemic ecosystems, such as the Amazon uh, forest or, or oceans that uh, um, could, if, if they are disrupted, could trigger major uh, impacts worldwide. So for example, for the Amazon forest, we know that um, when we cut too much trees, uh, then the, the, um, the evaporation process is, is threatened and then it could convert the part of the Amazon forest into savanna, which, which would have major global uh, consequences. So, so yeah, I, I agree that the, the dimension is both local and, uh, and uh, global, and there could also be some sort of local effects, but, but with trickling down uh, effects through value chains, for example. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, I hope that answers part of the question. Uh, well, quickly on, on biodiversity, so, I mean, I think it's the, the main issue here is energy density. Now, if we switch to from something that is very energy dense, like fossil fuels or also nuclear, that kind of uh, technologies, to something that is very 
as an issue with energy density, we have an issue with the land use. So that, that's a potential trade-off. But there are other examples where we are, we are going the same direction. Reforestation is good for carbon capture, is good for providing some ecosystem services like repairing from flooding or from landslining and this kind of stuff. So I think that probably we should focus on those areas where we are going in the same direction uh, using a uh, nature-based solution, for example, for climate change. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that, that that's not always the case. Um, on, on the role of monetary policy and uh, monetary policy and, and financial stability, you know, I mean, that, that's not the situation in every uh, jurisdiction, but at least in Europe, in the Euro system, we both have to preserve price stability and preserve financial stability. I think that for financial stability, at least in a protective way, having in mind that your own assets, the one that you are in, in your own balance sheet, may be run the risk of, you know, of being stranded because of transition risk. I mean, it's something that you have to do. It's, it's aligned to your mandate. Uh, price stability is tricky, and I connect uh, to the example, the, to the last question that is, you know, you should probably not put money in the oil companies. Well, that, that's a clearly example of, uh, I think that uh, uh, if we less, less resources are going towards a company in this moment, so this is somehow can disrupt the supply of uh, fossil fuels in a moment when there is an excess demand, this is going to contrast with the, uh, uh, you know, the point of keeping down inflation. So probably you're going to increase even more your interest rates. <laughs> so that's a typical example. There are no uh, free lunch. I mean, we are all economists, we know that. But in that case, it's clearly, I think that uh, uh, the first mandate is going to kick in. And not because, uh, this does, does not mean the central bankers, they are not aware of climate change or not aware of the transition. I mean, we have no tools for that. That's not our job. Uh, really call the uh, uh, environmental and energy ministry should meet with, <laughs> uh, with Daniel Franco, that is the head of treasury, and, and see if there is a plan, if you, you can use fiscal tools or other stuff for that. I mean, it's really not our job. We have to be aware of that policies. We have to be aware of the direction and help as much as we can. Uh, an example we just set up in our non-monetary policy portfolio, we are going to have uh, thematic portfolios to put more money in innovative systems, to engage with uh, energy intensive companies to see their transition plans. So we, you want our money, let me see what are your plans. So that's, that's something we can do, but we cannot use the tool of monetary policy because they simply do, it doesn't work. I mean, they are not made for that. That's my opinion, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, th th thanks a lot. Indeed, I will start from the monetary policy uh, one just to link with what Ivan was saying. So, I mean, first of all, um, we are in the quiet period. <laughs> there are monetary policy decisions coming soon, so I cannot really talk about this topic <laughs> right now. Um, so, generally speaking, I, I just agreed with what Ivan was saying. I think we need to disentangle a little bit what are the objectives and, and what are the, the true mandates. So, given the strategy review or since the strategy review of last year, financial stability is one of the pillars of the price stability mandate, which is also, let's say, now including included into monetary policy decisions. So, I think this is one of the... Um, uh, it's one of the key, let's say, highlights uh, from the strategy review of last year. So at, at the second still remaining general, uh, uh, again last year, the, the Euro system announced uh, in the context of the monetary policy strategy review, also a very deep uh, um, review of how uh, the monetary policy decisions should incorporate uh, climate change. So there is an entire roadmap that develops around three years, so from now to 2024. And one of the key um, steps in, in this regard uh, about uh, um, monetary policy decisions is really to incorporate uh, climate change uh, and the uh, impact of the transition into the macroeconomic and fiscal projections. So I think this is work that is still in progress, it's ongoing, but especially in this context is going to be key. Uh, an energy team has been created uh, specifically to answer one of these questions or to address the current situations within the ECB, exactly because energy has never been uh, officially included or let's say uh, so deeply included in our models, but now it's one of the core parts uh, that uh, is, is uh, going to inform uh, macroeconomic projections and as a consequence also monetary policy decisions. Um, the second one uh, that I would like to address is uh, about Professor Hansen's also um, point on, on stress testing or scenario analysis, because I very much agree with that. Uh, a couple of caveats here to really 
put also what I was presenting before into context. First of all, we are using a set of tools. So the top-down exercise or stress test I presented is just one of a set of other exercises we are developing. So we are complementing this with a bottom-up uh, view that is gonna be published very soon. I cannot say when, but very soon. And this is really gonna complement our view about the, the resilience of the financial system using a different methodology. And the, the objective so far was, as you correctly pointed out, first push banks into this direction. So try to really flag to banks that these risks are material and that they need to uh, uh, update their internal management practices to account for these risks. Um, banks in Europe are quite advanced but their level of advance advancement is really heterogeneous and outside Europe is even worse. So first step here is to really create awareness and try to push them going to the right direction. Second was for us to learn how these exercises work because I didn't know anything about climate change until three years ago. So, and uh, like me, also my entire team. So we really, we also had to build know-how and expertise in-house to, to try to see how these challenges could be addressed and based on this develop the new phase, new vintage of stress tests that hopefully are gonna be more sophisticated and can go into the direction that you pointed out. Um, on biodiversity and, and uh, here uh, pretty quickly, uh, we are at a very early stage, I have to say, internally. So we, we are right now thinking how to conceptualize the issue and uh, a more, let's say, holistic or quantitative approaches will follow in due course. But we kind of took the decision of using a stepwise approach, starting from climate change, trying to really develop it uh, a bit deeper and then move to the next step uh, as a, as a follow-up. So. Uh, just to be also like to manage expectations here. And, and the final point is about the political pressure. So uh, we don't really have it in, in house. So we are a very independent institution. The way we account for political decisions is in the level of uncertainty once again. So for us, it's, that just means trying to explore different uh, scenarios or possible alternatives and see how the system could react into this, uh, under these different assumptions. And with this, possibly inform uh, political bodies to take the decision that is going to minimize these impacts. Thank you very much. So let me take this uh, policy session uh, to its end. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have further questions, doubts, or comments, I'm sure that our uh, panelists would be, would be happy to engage further. Uh, let me remind you that after the coffee break now, we have uh, the last set of uh, uh, parallel scientific sessions. And for those of you who opted in tonight, we have the social dinner at Coconuts at 8 p.m. Thank you again for being here, and I'll see you soon. Thank you for coming. <laughs>